Well, welcome everyone, and uh, welcome particularly to the start of a new series that we're, we're starting uh, with uh, this talk. It's a series on the book of Revelation. And so I hope you're up for this. I hope it's going to be a blessing to you. And I'm really glad that you've joined us for it. So let me read to you uh, from Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present his revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. Well, in this run-up to Christmas 2021, I thought it would be a great idea to take another look at the book of the Bible that deals with the culmination of world events, which is also the book that has probably caused more controversy than any other. It's the most controversial book within the most controversial book in the history of the world. So it shouldn't present <laughs> too much of a problem for us. Now, we're looking at this in the run-up to celebrating the season of peace and goodwill to all people. And those attributes are good ones to bring into a study of this book. We're not going to agree on everything. You may have a completely different view to this than I have, and that's okay. It's okay to disagree. After all, none of us has the absolute perfect insight into all, thing, all things. It's not whether we disagree or not so much as how we do it. We need to do it with peace and goodwill. So with that in mind, I want to spend a six-week period not going into minute detail about such things as potential references to drone warfare or whether nuclear weapons are mentioned in, uh, in this book, or even seeking to, to uncover when it's all going to happen. What I want to do is to enable us to understand the structure of this book, understand some of the, the background knowledge that the book was originally based on, and that's going to help us to see what this letter is getting at a bit more clearly. Well, there are a number of different overall ways that people interpret the book of Revelation. And the first four verses of the book of Revelation, I've just read them, tell us four things about this book. So in verse 1 of chapter 1, it tells us this is an apocalyptic book. Now that's referring to the, the type of literature that, that it is. It's a, a revelation. Verse 2 of chapter 1 tells us that it's a testimony or a witness about Jesus Christ. Verse 3 of chapter 1 tells us it's a prophecy, which is, as someone once said, light from the future shining on the present. And then verse 4 tells us it's a letter. So it has a pastoral element to it. Well, there are four major ways of interpreting Revelation. The first view is that it's, it's all in the past. It was written solely for the time in which the Apostle John lived. There was suffering, the church was being persecuted, and so John wrote this letter to encourage the church of his day to hang on, because God will rescue you. But that, of course, would mean that it has, no, uh, has had no direct meaning for the past 2,000 years. Well, view number two, uh, it's all in the future. It's all predictive of the last days of the earth. It's a popular view, but again, the problem would be that it would have had no meaning for the past 2,000 years. Then there's view number three, which is that it's a symbolic portrayal of timeless truths. And those truths are relevant for whatever age you're in. Now, people who hold this view, they generally 
uh, speaking, not believe in the rapture or the tribulation happening for a little seven years, or the thousand-year reign on earth of Christ, that's the millennium. This is what's called the amillennial view. Well, then there's view number four, and that relates to human history, or that is that it relates to human history, past, present, and future, and that it points us prophetically, not just to seven specific churches that John knew about, but also to the seven ages of the church in history. Now, these seven churches were real churches of, of John's day, but they were also representative of the church throughout the ages, followed by the rapture and the tribulation and the second coming and the millennial reign of Christ and on into eternity. Now, let me say again that Different people have different views, but my view, which I want to explain over the coming weeks, is the fourth view, that it relates to human history, past, present, and future. And the reasons that I think that view is uh, the one that best fits the text, we'll, we'll look at together, and you can form your opinion on that. But in essence, it seems to me that the book of Revelation is dealing with three time periods. And those three time periods are summed up in the verse that is really the master key to unlocking the overall structure of this letter. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. That's chapter 1, verse 19. Now, that's Jesus talking to John the Apostle as he was in exile on the island of Patmos in the year 95 AD. What he's saying is that there are three time frames outlined in this revelation. The past, the present, that is John's present, and the future. The past, write therefore what you have seen. Now, what has John seen? Well, he's seen Jesus as he now is, risen and glorified. He's described in, in, in chapter 1, uh, where chapter 1 deals with John's past, Jesus as he has been revealed. Then there's the, the present, what is now. That is to say, John's present, which is our past, if, if you see what I mean. The present is revealed as the church age, and it's covered in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. Now, Jesus highlights seven churches which were real, there and then churches. But why those particular churches? Well, many Bible scholars believe, I would agree with them, that these seven actual churches also prophetically represent seven ages, seven eras of the church, stretching from John's present day in 95 AD up to our present day. Now, these letters outline the features of the church in each age, both bad and good. And history can testify to the accuracy of the view that these actual churches are prophetic of the church age, the present, but looking forward to the future. And then there is the future element of Revelation. What will take place later? The end times. And this starts at chapter 4 and continues until the end of chapter 22. Now, how do we know it starts at the beginning of chapter 4? Well, because of the words that chapter 4 verse 1 starts with and ends with. In Greek, the words are meta-tauta. Meta-tauta means after this or after these things. Now, what things? Well, after what's just been described, the church age. The church age ends with the rapture of the church and launches the period of time known as the tribulation. And chapters 4 and 5 describe the rapture and the church in heaven with chapter 6 launching into the tribulation with the earth in judgment. Then, in chapter 19, we see Jesus returning to earth at the second coming, reigning on earth for a thousand years in chapter 20. 
before the new heaven and the new earth appearing in chapters 21 and 22. The past, the present and the future. The whole book outlined in chapter 1 verse 19. Revelation has in some ways received the same fate as something called the Maseroth. Now the Maseroth, or the Maserot, I should say, better pronounced, is a Hebrew word meaning the study of the stars, as understood and practiced by the Magi. Originally, the heavens declared the glory of God and each constellation revealed an aspect of the gospel and God's wonderful plan of salvation. However, that was corrupted in Babylon to come to be seen as a secret way of predicting the future of human beings. So astrology has become a modern-day deception and corruption of the original God-ordained thing called the Maseroth. Well, a similar fate has befallen Revelation. It's become this secret writing that is supposed to reveal the future of human beings. But originally, the revelation of Jesus Christ was, was just that. See, the real story of Revelation is that it helps us to understand who Jesus is. It's not fundamentally about us. It's fundamentally about him. It is about our future, but our future as a product of who Jesus is and what he's done. Now, John's told to start with what he has seen. And so that's exactly where John does start, with Jesus introducing himself. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. The first and the last, or in Hebrew, the Aleph Tav. This is a direct claim to be God himself, as he was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Here, in 95 AD, just 60 years after the resurrection, stands Jesus. But he was not just standing randomly, he was standing amongst the seven lampstands. And as John introduces the seven lampstands, he is announced by John as one like a son of man. So, as we know, the lampstands represent churches, the light of the world. Jesus appears amongst the lamps. Son of man is a title given to the Messiah in Daniel. The robe and the sash are the garments of a judge and a king. The hair as white as wool is also a picture seen in Daniel. There, God is called the Ancient of Days with snow white hair to show that he is indeed ancient. He has eyes of fire. Well, fire illuminates, it refines, it purifies. And this is how Jesus views his church. Bronze represents judgment. And Jesus' feet are like bronze, glowing in a furnace. His voice is like rushing waters, which means that, uh, that it's majestic and powerful. Out of his mouth comes a double-edged sword. This is a direct reference to the word of God, which comes from the mouth of God and pierces, dividing bone from marrow. As I say, bronze represents judgment, and Jesus is pictured as having feet that were like bronze glowing in the furnace. His face like the sun, it shines in all its brilliance. Now, we might not be able to picture all of that or to imagine the sense of awe that, that, that John felt at the sight, but we do know what he did as a direct result. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his hand on me and said, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. Not only the Aleph and the Tav, but eternal. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. I am alive forever and ever. Eternal, 
omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. He is God, the same yesterday, today and forever. He holds the very keys to unlock the gates of Hades. And John's instructed to write, therefore, what he has seen. He's seen Jesus, fully God and fully man, standing at the centre of his church. And as we'll see next time, he is the God who passionately believes in his church and has always been fully committed to his bride. But he's a holy God who will not overlook sin and who, even more fervently than Paul, wants his bride to be pure and spotless. And so he challenges the, the, the church in each age to aspire to be the church that it can be, that it's destined to be. He will not settle for less, and he will not let us just settle for less. He gave his life for you and me, and he calls us to give our lives for him and for his kingdom cause. There is no greater calling, no bigger challenge, no greater reward. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Lord of the church. You are our hope. You are the Alpha. You are the Omega, the beginning and the end. You are the one who holds life and death in his hands. And I thank you that whatever the church in John's day was going through, whatever the church in our day is going through, whatever we as individuals are going through, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have it all in your hands, that you have our lives securely in your hands. And I thank you that you are the God who speaks with authority, the God who judges justly, the God who is our King, our Lord, the one who said, I will build my church, the one who comes to rescue and redeem us. And so as we start on this journey through this wonderful, amazing book, Revelation. I thank you in advance for all that you're going to reveal to us about yourself, but I thank you most of all that you reveal the glory that is to come for those who trust in you. Lord, may our trust in you grow and deepen and strengthen week by week as we look at your word together as we are transformed by your living word in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I really hope and pray that this series on Revelation inspires you. And as I said at the beginning, even if you have a different take on some of the aspects that we'll be looking at, my prayer is that you'll really engage with the word of God and have reasons for the hope that you, you, you hold on to. And I, and I pray that as we go through this book, you'll find your excitement levels rising, your passion increasing, and your confidence in him growing week by week. So see you next time as we get into this uh, amazing book in, in a more detailed way, looking at the, the seven churches that are mentioned and how they correspond to seven eras, seven ages of the church. See you next time.